Well, hi, everybody. Happy April and welcome into Unanchored Boston as we begin the month of April and we begin the baseball season. And we are brought to you by Cold Springs RV, your destination for all things camping and where? Where? New Hampshire, of course. And by the great George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota. If it's baseball season and we want to talk baseball, there's only one guy to talk to, and it's the great Pete Abraham. And Bob Lobel always handles the formal introduction. So, Robert, take it away. Well, I'm really glad to have Pete on uh, today. It was uh, with the passing of Larry Lachino and, uh, you know, I guess we're tired of talking about the dynasty, but it may come up in our conversations today. But it's been all dynasty all the time for a, a while, and people just kind of forgot that the Major League Baseball season started and the Red Sox have actually started their West Coast trip. And Pete, who covers the Red Sox for the uh, Boston Globe, is uh, – well, he did a great story on Larry Lachino, and maybe we should start there. Pete, welcome, and thanks for being with us. And uh, you did a great job on, well, in overall covering the Red Sox, but I really loved your Larry Lachino um, tribute because it was really right on the money. Maybe maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Is that okay, Lynchy? we start there? Fine with me. Excellent. All right, good. Uh, yeah, well, th thanks for having me, guys. It's a real honor to be with you. And uh, I know it is, Pete. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, geez, Larry, I mean, as I wrote, I'm, I'm not so sure everything that happened with the Red Sox going back to when they first bought the team would have happened without him. And uh, he was certainly uh, an interesting figure in Boston baseball history, uh, a demanding guy, a caring guy who did a lot of things for people, you know, charity-wise with the Jimmy Fund and Dana Farber and uh, the Pan Mass Challenge, all of these different things that he did, um, but also a mentor to a lot of the people who became the Red Sox. You look at, you know, Theo. He was the guy who bought Theo Epstein to Boston. He was the guy who bought Sam Kennedy to Boston. He was the guy who bought a lot of the executives who are still there into the Red Sox organization. So, all of those people are what made you know the the team and and put together the four championships. And they've hit a little bit of a bad stretch lately. Um, and I don't know that that's not coincidental to Larry not being part of the team anymore. I think he had a lot to do with their success. Pete, let me ask you this. Is it fair to say that a lot of people are talkers and few people are doers? And Larry was a doer. Yeah, he sure was. And I think 85% of the time it, it helped the Red Sox. There were a few times he, he missed, uh, but he never lacked conviction. I think that was the thing. He would do something and he was full steam ahead. Uh, he believed in what he was doing. Uh, you know, he, he had obviously a, a tremendous amount of experience in baseball before he got to Boston. And really, like, you know, the kind of sports executive you don't see anymore. He he was with the Washington Redskins for a while as one of their lawyers. He worked for two other baseball teams before he got to Boston. He played in the Final Four for Princeton with Bill Bradley. You know, he had this, you know, huge life of different experiences in sports. And I think he brought all of those things to the table with, with all of the things that he did. You know, one of the interesting things I always thought about Larry, and we'll talk about his mistakes first. Well, we can start with Bobby Valentine, but we, and he made some big, he made some big time mistakes, but he always managed to admit it and correct it. But I always thought that his, him coming from Pittsburgh, which was similar to Boston neighborhood wise and, he was able to make that transition easily. He can, no matter what town he lived in or city he lived in, he always was able to adapt to the culture of that particular city. And he certainly did that here in Boston. Unlike Tom Werner, I would just, I'd throw that in, but that's, we, we can talk about that later. But let's maybe start with the, the Bobby Valentine debacle and, and some of the things that Larry did not do right because he did so many more great things, so, you know, but. It, in all fairness to him, he would probably be the first to admit it. You know, the Bobby Valentine thing was was interesting the way it all happened. After Terry Francona left following the 2011 season, the Red Sox had this huge public search. They bought in like six people. They actually had them come to Fenway Park and do interviews with all the beat writers. Like they did like a post-interview uh, press conference, which I had never really? seen before. So they had all these candidates, and Ben Charrington was the new GM was, you know, he was charged with, with picking somebody out. So he picks Dale Swain, who's one uh, a longtime major league coach. And they, you know, that's the decision. They're going to hire Dale Swain. All he has to do is go to the uh, GM meetings and meet with John and Tom and Larry, and everything will be taken care of. So we go to Milwaukee. 
those three guys go off to lunch at this place near the Fister Hotel, and they were all waiting literally on the sidewalk for them to come back and say, okay, Dale Swaim is the manager. They come back, and Larry walks into the hotel lobby and says, the search is open. So I still to this day don't know what Dale Swaim did. He must have spilled a drink on somebody or done something. And within a couple of days, it became clear that they were going off their list all of the people they interviewed, they were going to hire Bobby Valentine. And having covered Bobby Valentine when I was covering the Mets, I said to Nick Cafardo at the time, it's only a question of how long it's going to take before this goes wrong. And it was, it was about a month and a half, really. Spring training was a disaster, and the whole season was a disaster. And they quickly fired Bobby, hired John Farrell, and won the World Series. So it, 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 took, it was a, a very tumultuous year, but they did the right thing in the end. So do you think that, that, that John and Tom uh, overruled uh, uh, Larry or and Larry took the fall for it? Or do you think it was Larry's idea to, to you know, uh, go, off, go off the truck? Oh, it was Larry's idea to, to hire Bobby. And it was that old – it was the old idea that they had a players manager in, in Francona. Let's get somebody who will give the team some discipline. And, and it seems like all teams in sports do that. Like they try to go away from the guy who they just got rid of. It's almost like the Patriots with Mayo, like – we're getting, you know, Belichick is gone. He was a disciplinarian. Now we're going to bring in this guy who's going to be the, you know, a, a friend to the players. We'll see how that works. Well, it didn't work with the Red Sox. They bought in the disciplinarian, and he, he was shouting at him the first day of spring training. And you could almost see the on the face, you know, the faces of the players that this, this wasn't going to work, and it didn't work. I think when he held the dance contest that he, uh, that he himself won in, in spring training, that was the big tip off to me. I said, this guy, this was crazy. And the, the other thing that was funny in spring training was, uh, you, you know, you guys have been down there. They have a bunch of TVs in the clubhouse, and they have, you know, Major League Baseball Network on and all of this other stuff. Bobby made them shut off all of the cable channels, and the only thing they showed on the TV were cutoffs and relays the way he thought they should be done. So <laughs> Joya and Ortiz, all of these players come in, and they're like, hey, you know, where's, you know, we want to watch whatever's on Major League Network. And the, the, the clubhouse guy said, no, Bobby won't let us. You have to watch these cutoffs and relays. And they were on the entire day. You couldn't change the channel. And finally, one of the players, I don't know what they did. They broke into something and found the remote, and they changed the channel. And, <laughs> and Bobby was mad about that. And it was like, you know, you could tell right away this was, this was going to be an interesting year. Amazing. Amazing. So, but what brings us back to Lakino, I guess, in um... – you're right, Mike. That's a great question. Did Larry take the fall because he'd be one? Of, he was a you know, a loyal guy, and if he needed to do it, he needed to do it. But Pete, I, maybe we can just talk about why when we had Larry, we had Larry on about three months ago, right, Mike? But yeah. um, and he was talking about selling the Worcester Red Sox, and we could tell he was in some distress because he'd been fighting cancer. These you know, three different types of cancer that you brought up. And you also brought up the Hall of Fame thing. It was just, but on an opening day, now these guys, this is a pretty big agenda. When the Red Sox come back here to Boston, they've got the 2004 team. They've got a uh, minus shilling. They have the Wakefield's uh, tribute, of course. And now Larry. And at some point, I, I kind of feel Larry ought to be the lead story in this whole thing on opening day. Yeah, that, that's going to be, you know, obviously they weren't planning for this. They, they had the whole Wakefield thing set up and uh, they're going to, you know, they're going to have a patch on the uniform for Wake. And, uh, you know, obviously the way that all went down, you know, was such a terrible thing. I, I, I would hope they would do something for Larry, whether it's, you know, whether it's something on the scoreboard or something on the uniform or whatever it might be, because uh, he was, you know, clearly a hugely important guy. Um, well, I think part of the shame of it is, um, not, you know, the current players don't know who he is, you know, because he left the team, I think it was in 2014 or 15. So Alex Cora knows who he is and, you know, the coaches and, and the people around Fenway, but the current players don't don't know who he is. So, yeah, but maybe, maybe, you know, current, we don't know who the current players are. So well, that's true. Yeah, that's true too. But it's, uh, you know, yeah, the, hopefully the Red Sox, you know, they, they, they always seem to do the right thing in these occasions and, and hopefully there'll be some sort of, Tribute to Larry uh, on opening day. I would. I'm, I'm certain there will be. You know, I, I was thinking about Pete. Um, I was thinking about the efforts by Robert Kraft to get himself into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, 
And then I'm looking at the resume of Larry Lacchino, not just with the Red Sox, with Baltimore, with uh, uh, San Diego, and also with the Blue Sox, if you want to throw them in. And what he has done, his many contributions to the game of baseball, and I see a victory in a landslide for Lucchino over Robert Kraft in two different sports. Who is more worthy of, of the Hall of Fame in their sport? And I think it's hands down Larry Lucchino over Robert Kraft. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, and I've gotten involved with the Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm on a committee to pick the ballot for the BBWA and, and some other things. And the, the process for people who aren't players is, is very sort of secretive. They have these committees that meet, and they choose the players who have been passed over by the writers, uh, executives, and then there's another ballot for players be, uh, from, from before 1980, kind of like the old-timers, you know, going back to the start of baseball. And these committees meet once every three years. They, they have a second ballot, and they, they pick people. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So the last ballot, with which they looked at in December, was executives, umpires, and managers. And they had eight people. They voted, and Jim Leland was the guy who got voted in. So Larry was considered for that ballot, but ultimately he wasn't put on that ballot. And I was kind of curious, you know, why was that? Because it seems to me – you know, he's a no-brainer to at least be considered, if not voted in. And what I was told is when you look at the executives who are in the Hall of Fame, it's typically three three sort of groups of people, commissioners, uh, owners, and people who, who ran the teams, executives like Branch Rickey and, you know, the, the general managers, the guys who put together the roster. Well, Larry's not any of those three guys. He was never a commissioner. He was never the owner. He was never the guy who put together the team. There aren't really any team presidents in the Hall of Fame. But my argument, and I made it in the paper, is, you know, if, if there was somebody who should be, it should be Larry because of the ballparks that he built, uh, because of what he meant to the Red Sox, and and just, you know, the, the amount of time that he was in baseball. When you look at the ballparks, they were building ballparks in a certain way until Camden Yards was built. And since they built Camden Yards, Every ballpark, literally every ballpark, has had touches of Camden Yards. And it changed the way that, you know, that, that people watch the game, the, the way they interact with the game. Those concrete ovals that they built in the 80s, uh, they've all been pretty much torn down. And all of the parks now are these retro parks with the fans closer to the field, with all the amenities, with the old-time touches. And that was all because of Larry. And if that's not a Hall of Famer, I don't really know who should be in the Hall of Fame. I agree. I mean, he, everything from designing ballparks to, uh, I don't know if you know, you, you've seen this 10 times more times than I've seen it, but when there's a day-night doubleheader at Fenway, every employee of the club comes out after the first game with a trash bag, and they go up and down the the, 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 at the rows, and they empty the trash. And there's Larry Lucchino, you know, with a pair of uh, rubber gloves on, and he's stuffing empty popcorn boxes and then stale beer and everything into And to me, that, that just said an awful lot that he does everything from helping design and renovate Fenway Park, and he's picking up trash between games of a doubleheader. Yeah, that, you know, you guys mentioned the uh, the Worcester Red Sox, too. I mean, that team very easily could have gone somewhere else if Larry hadn't stepped in. And he stepped in, tried to make a deal with, with Pawtucket. It couldn't be done, and then changed directions and was able to build that ballpark in Worcester. And it's a beautiful ballpark, and it, it, it revitalized the section of that city, it's added a lot of revenue to the city. Everybody, you know, how often do you see a deal like that made and everybody turns out happy about it? And, and you know, that, you know, he, he did a lot to help, uh, you know, help Worcester. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I just hope at some point the Hall of Fame figures out a way to get him on the ballot. Let the people who picked that debate the issues. And I think if they, if they give it a fair look, he, you know, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Well, it's important, I think, Pete, that people here understand with the contribution that he made, whether he makes the Hall of Fame or not, yeah. there's one thing, and that's a you know a personal honor and a tribute to him. But in the psyche of the of the Boston sports fans, I, it would be great if they were able, to, and I'm sure able to grasp just what Larry was able to accomplish here. Not not John, not Tom for sure. You know, not this other. You know, not a lot of guys. Not Theo even. Um, but Larry was really the moving force behind all of this. As you said, those guys brought the money. Theo brought the vision, but his vision was different than Larry's. 
and uh, you know <clears throat> there were conflicts. Maybe we should talk about the conflict with Theo and the conflict with Tom Werner. What happened with those? What what did happen with those guys? Well, you know, with Theo, I, I think it was it was you know sort of Theo was an, an an unknown guy, a guy who worked for the Padres, and he wasn't initially considered to be the GM. Different guys fell through. And Larry championed the idea of hiring Theo, you know, a 28-year-old guy who, who certainly wasn't on anybody's list to be the next GM. And But Larry saw something in Theo that others didn't. And, you know, we, we know what happened. Theo made a lot of great choices and, and built some tremendous teams. But there was friction. And, you know, Theo's a young, really smart guy. And he wanted autonomy to do different things. And Larry was a headstrong older guy and he wanted to be able to say, Hey, I want you to run everything by me and I want to know what's going on. And I want to have a role in every decision. And they butted heads. And, you know, Theo had that time in, in 2005 when he left and he came back. And then when the team had the collapse in 11, you know, I think he had just had enough and he wanted to go somewhere on his own and not have to answer to somebody. And, and the Cubs were happy to give him that. Um, I think they mended fences, you know, later on, uh, you know, Theo obviously came back and, and joined the Red Sox, uh, you know, last year as an advisor. And Theo had some really nice things to say about Larry yesterday that we had in another article in the Globe. So, I, you know, theirs was, you know, they didn't have a, a bitter relationship. I think they had a lot of, you know, tough moments in the heat of action. But, I, you know, I think in the end, they probably both came to appreciate each other. But, you know, you see that in a lot of businesses, I think, that people who don't necessarily always get along, produce something good because, you know, sometimes that tension creates something that, that works. And, you know, two very smart guys, two Ivy League educated guys, two guys who had a lot of knowledge about what they were doing. And in the end, it, I mean, shoot, it worked out for the Red Sox. They, they won three championships together. So uh, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to say it didn't work. And what about the, the follow-up on Bob's second part of his question? What happened with Tom Werner? Or did anything happen? Yeah, our, our third of my Ivy League guy. I'm sorry, Pete. Our third Ivy League guy is uh, sitting above you. That's all. You know, whoever's in the Ivy League, whoever's from the Ivy League, please raise your hand, and we'll get it over with. I went to UMass. I got nothing to say. Um, but I, I don't. You know, I'm not. I, I wasn't. I, I picked up the Sox beat in 2010. So I think a lot of that happened before I got on the beat. Um, you know, but but yeah, I think there was to some degree of falling out. Uh, but, I, you know, I think a lot of it just comes back to Larry, you know, being, you know, I think literally a lot of times the loudest voice in the room and, and, and somebody who was convinced that he was right on a lot of things. And, and you know, at some point, the, the, the three guys who had put together those great teams and I think really rescued Fenway Park and, and put the franchise on the right track after so many years that it wasn't, uh, you know, they had to split up and they did. Larry you know, Larry stepped down in 14 and uh, the Sox have, you know, went on. So um, whether that's for the best or not, you know, it's hard to say, but but I, it did seem like Larry, some of the major mistakes of his time came towards the end. And I'm sure that probably hastened his departure. You know, I, I thought one of the great examples of who Larry Lacino is, uh, I'm going to be the guy out front. I'm going to be the guy making decisions. I'm the guy that's going to be defending this, this franchise was when Dan Shaughnessy, and we've talked to Dan about this, his book came out about Terry Francona. And Dan Dan sat in the front row. And I think the day that Larry was holding his press conference, it rained. And we were in that little room uh, indoors. And so Larry was sitting there at the table. And Dan, of course, you know, wanted to ask him about the book. And, and Larry refused to acknowledge that Dan was even on the planet, right? You remember that? Next question, please. Next question, please. And he'd be looking over there. Next question. Next question. He wasn't going to yield one inch. He wasn't going to get into a, a, a verbal battle with Dan. He just, he, he made, he wished and he almost willed Dan invisible that day. When I, when I was covering the Yankees, there was some dispute going on with Larry and, and Randy Levine. And we were at the winter meetings and, and Larry was holding an impromptu press conference in the hallway. And I asked him a question about this dispute with the Yankees. And he said, I refute the premise of your question. And that was a great, it was, you know, that was really a great part of your. And I don't like, where do, you, where do you go from that? I don't, I didn't know what to, I was like, well, like too bad. Like I answer the question. Like I didn't know what to say, <laughs> but that, you know, he treated Q and A's like a lawyer, really. I mean, you guys saw that when, you know, you and you were at Fenway. I mean, he would, he would, 
you know, he wouldn't accept your question. He would he would throw it back at you and ask you a question. And it, it was he was a challenging guy to interview. He really was. Yeah, he was. That, that, that thing, I think that but I think that was all part of who Larry was. And 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 he was a he he. he you knew we stood with Larry. I guess is the simplest way to put it. There was no hidden agenda. There was no whispering behind behind a curtain. If he didn't like Pete Abraham, he'd tell Pete Abraham right in front of everybody. Oh yeah, yeah. But you know, at the same time, you could have a you know a public you know not a fight, but like an alter you know an altercation with him. But then if you called him and said, "Hey, I need to know something about this story that I'm working on. I want to make sure I have it right. You know, can I ask you a couple of questions?" He would return your call, yeah. and he would try to put you in the right direction and. I think he cared about what people thought about the team. He wanted to make sure the team's thoughts on things, you know, were, were part of what you were considering when you wrote something. And, you know, to be honest with you, we don't get that as much anymore. And, and Larry was a guy, I think, as much as he would probably not admit it, he respected that that the people in the media had a job to do. Now, let, let me ask you this question, Pete. Uh, and I think you referenced it today that the Red Sox um, – Fenway Park has is, is become a destination for people that, that come and visit Boston. And it wasn't always the case for players or for fans. The fans saw the game, they went home. How much did Larry Lacchino have to do with this becoming a national treasure? Someplace when you go to Boston, you've got to see the Freedom Trail, you got to see Old Ironside, you got to see the, the North End, and you must go to Fenway Park. Yeah, I, you know, that was Larry and I think Charles Steinberg, too, to a large extent. And what always strikes me is, is you know, I show up at the park at, you know, 2.30, uh, you know, for the early clubhouse access. And there's always, I mean, always cold days, rainy days, it doesn't matter. A hundred people lined up on the sidewalk waiting to take a tour of Fenway Park. Yeah. And they're happily handing over 25 bucks or whatever it is to go into a ballpark where there's nothing going on. <laughs> they walk around and they take photos and they see the trophies and they, you know, whatever they do. I mean, that didn't exist until the Red Sox came up with the, and now everybody does it. Yeah. And the idea that, and I can remember when I was a kid, you guys remember, you know, remember this too. Fenway Park was only open 81 times a year. That was, there was nothing else going on at Fenway Park. And Joe Mooney would not let you walk on the field. You could certainly <laughs> not walk around Fenway Park. There was nothing <laughs> like that. I can remember covering a New England college all-star game at Fenway. They had, it was division one against division two and three. All of these kids are excited as can be to be on the field at Fenway Park. They wouldn't let them take batting practice because they didn't want them to mess up the field. They could only they could walk on the field, play, and then they had to get the hell off. Like, that was it. And they, you couldn't trust in the clubhouse. You couldn't do anything. They had to leave right away. And now Fenway Park is open. How many days? I mean, it's got to be, right, 250 days a year, whatever it is. Yeah. Concerts and football games and all of these things. Um, and every now every stadium, all of the ballparks have concerts and all of this stuff. The Yankees have a bowl game. Everybody has a game uh, other than baseball. And that was from the Red Sox. The, the Red Sox came up with this idea. And you think about it, it's amazing that all of this time, nobody ever thought like, hey, let's do this. You know, let's let's try to have a concert. Let's try to have whatever. It, you know, they had football games, obviously, at Fenway when the Patriots were there. But then they went decades without anything going on. Right. So, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, what they did. So many teams copied what the Red Sox do. Did um, tell me about the relationship between uh, Larry Lacchino and Charles Steinberg? Where did it start? Well, in Baltimore, when when you know Charles was from Baltimore and he grew up, he was the guy who was handing Earl Weaver's uh, index cards with stats on them when he was a kid. And when Larry got to Baltimore, he saw Charles as somebody who shared his vision and uh, you know could could make things happen, and, and he knew the city. And those guys went together to San Diego. They built a park in San Diego. When Larry joined that Red Sox ownership group, Charles came with him. And, uh, you know, Charles was, you know, all of these, the, the pregame ceremonies that everybody talks about at Fenway, all of the great different things that they've done. You know, Charles was the, the guy behind that, you know, the, the, the impresario in a lot of ways. And whether that was the memorial service for Ted Williams or the celebrations of the championships you know, bringing the Boston Pops and, and setting them up on the infield, all of these different things that they did, that was all Charles. And uh, they were a formidable combination. And, and they were, you know, they are in Worcester. You know, Charles is the, is running a team in Worcester now for when Larry bought the, the, the Woo Sox. So, uh, and, and so many teams went to school on what the Red Sox did with these ceremonies and with these events. And, you know, they came up with all of these different ideas and other teams copied them. And, 
when, when I go around and we go around and we see games on the road, you say, oh, that, that was something the Red Sox did. They, they've almost become a, a victim of their own success because they're so successful off the field. Um, you know, ski jumps at Fenway Park. It's just oh <laughs> hockey games. Um, you know, uh, but there's, there's a golf course inside, uh, the, inside, inside of Fenway Park that it brings us to, and I don't want to get into this just yet, but it brings us to where we are right now with the franchise. People will come no matter what their record is or how good or how bad this baseball team is. And it's a sad thing to say, but they may be a victim of their own success. Yeah, I think you're going to see small, some small crowds in April and May, but not in June, July, and August because Fenway has become a place for people to go from out of town. It's, I think if you're somebody who's visiting Boston in the summer, you try to go to Fenway Park, whether you're interested in the baseball game or not. And there were a lot of times last year when the Mets were in town, when the Blue Jays were in town, when the Cardinals and Cubs come to town, there are 45 – percent maybe fans of the other team at Fenway Park and that's not something we've seen in, in quite a long time there was a game last year the Mets fans were took up the entire right field grandstand and I think if you're the Red Sox owners you're like hey their money's as good as anybody else's but I know it was unsettling for the players and coaches to see that many fans of the other team in Fenway because they're used to seeing that when the Sox go on the road they're not used to seeing that at, at home so I, I think that's something you know Every, you know they're making money, but I think they, they you know, they, they want to get more of their own fans in the park than fans of the other team. Well, Pete, there is this existential dilemma of rooting for this team. The dilemma being, if you root for the team, you root for the owners, and you root for the philosophy behind it. And if the team succeeds, then the philosophy behind building the team succeeds. So it then becomes a dilemma if you really think about it. Why should I root for this team when I really want them to lose so that they change their method of operation? I know it's a little convoluted, but I, it just seems to be part of the dynamic out there now. Yeah, and, and it, but at the same time, it's hard. You know, how do you blame Alex Cora and the players? You know, it's not. I, I, no, absolutely. They're, they're out of the. They're the ones. They're the innocent bystanders. They're the collateral damage. Like I, I think it's it's funny. You know. The Globe did their their preview section. We did a you know, our preview. Not one of us picked the Red Sox to make the, the playoffs, and, and I think it was like eight of us who made choices. I can't remember that ever happening before. And so one, you know, one of the players said something to me like, "Geez, none of you guys think we're any good." And I said, "Well, yeah, I, I actually I don't know." <laughs> and, but you know, how do you you know you can't hold it against Tristan Costas? It's not his fault. It's not you know they they're trying. They're you know they want to be good players. Right. It's, but it, you know, I think you raise a good point, Bob. Like, would it be better if they if they were terrible and then it would it would force them to spend more money and get free agents and go back to what they used to do? Because if they succeed, they'll say, "See, we don't need to do that. We can we can just keep going the way we're going." So yeah, I don't you know I I don't. It's not my job to root for the team. That's somebody else's job. But it, it is going to be interesting to see how this all plays out because this is not the team they used to be in terms of being financial behemoths. Uh, there, I think they're, they have the 11th highest payroll in baseball, which, you know, certainly a heck of a lot better than the Colorado Rockies or whatever, but we're used to the Red Sox being first or second or third and having all of these great star players. They have some very good players, but they don't have the stars like they used to. Don't you think – one more thing, Lynch, and then – No, Mike, no, Mike, I don't mind. No, you're, you're in charge. You're <laughs> Let's go right back to Mookie Betts, who may be one of the greatest players ever to come down the pike. Most versatile, playing shortstop. He's off to a great start, blah, blah, blah. He's still, if not the same, a better player than anything they've ever had. And it all kind of started with, with that. Yeah, it did. And I wrote at the time – you know, that it's it's going to prove to be one of the worst decisions in team history, and somehow it's getting worse. Um, well, worse, it's getting, you know, it, it is surpassing Babe Ruth. I mean, and, and I know Dave Roberts pretty well, and I, I, when Mookie came back to Boston last year, I, I, I went to Cleveland to see the Dodgers and to talk to Mookie before the game in Boston, and I sat with Dave Roberts in the stands before the game, and after we got done talking, Dave said to me, 
the guy literally doesn't do anything wrong. He, he, if I ask him to play somewhere, he plays somewhere. He doesn't ask me why. He doesn't fight me. He plays second. He plays short. He plays right. He plays center, wherever they want. He's a team leader. He's a guy who does stuff charity, you know, charity wise in Los Angeles. He's the guy whose family puts together his parties for the players on days off, like all of these different things. Like they love him. They can't, you know, he, he's the perfect player for the Dodgers and has handled all of it magnificently. Like when we were at the all-star game last year, he's like the captain of the all-star team. All of the other players revolve around him. And every time I see this, I, I, I can't believe reasonable people sat in a room and said, well, we need to trade this guy. I, I can't, I, I don't know how that came that they did that. I just, it, it's mind boggling to me that, that they said, well, this is the right course of action. We'll trade him. I just don't get that. I, I never will understand that. And the signing of Rafael Devers obviously was, well, we got to do something. We don't have anybody left to sign to show everybody we're serious. And Devers was the guy, right guy, right place, right time. Yeah. And I'm not sure he's the right player. I mean, he's a good player, but I, you know, that that's that's the money you should have used for Mookie. I, I just I don't know. I just don't. And they they've tried to spin the idea that there there was no amount of money he was going to take. He was going to be a free agent. Well, when I went and sat with the kid, and he's never once misled me. I mean, I I've known him since he was drafted. He said him him he and his wife were looking at houses when he when he got the call that they that he had been traded. He didn't want to. He didn't. There were no you know. Well, I'm not going to negotiate with you. He thought the going back and forth was negotiations and that they would eventually come to a conclusion and, and sign a contract. He would stay in Boston for the rest of his career. He, you know, he was prepared to, to live here all, you know, all season long, all year long, raise his family here. He, he liked everything about it. And then he got a call one day and said, hey, you've been traded. So this whole idea that he was never going to make a deal, that's just not, you know, that's not right. That's not true. And that right there, you know, I, I, I think my, my question – was going to be um, when did this stop? When did this stop becoming a destination for people? And the answer probably is Mookie Betts. But since then, there really haven't been many free agents that even want to take a look at Boston. So it's almost like we turn the clock back twenty-five years. Yeah, I mean, when you think about if you're a really good player and you're a free agent, don't isn't the first thing that enters your mind is well, why didn't Mookie Betts want to stay there? Yeah. You know, that that would be my thought. Like if, if you know, if, if if the Globe had some great baseball writer and he left in the middle of his career and the Globe said, Hey, we're, we're looking to hire you, I think my, my first question would be, well, why did that guy leave? That was that would be what I would ask. Um and I, I don't know. I, I you know, money talks and if you offer a guy enough money, he'll come play for you. But I wonder if they'll get to a point where they have to overpay to get somebody good to come to Boston where they didn't used to have to do that. There were guys who wanted to come play here because you could win a championship. You could play for Terry Francona. You could be around Dustin Pedroia and David Ortiz. You knew you were going to have a pretty good chance to be in the World Series. Now you can't offer a player that. You know They, they need to build back up to get to that point. It's like Breslow. Um, he almost came here as a chance – to learn the position so that he can move on to some place where he's going to be successful. Yeah, that'll be interesting. He's he's a really smart guy, and he's done some. I mean, you look at what they've done with the pitching; they've done some smart things. I mean, they've they've turned some guys who weren't all that good in, into pretty good pitchers, and they've made some smart choices. You'd like to see what they could do with more talented players instead of the second tier guys. We're not going to see that obviously this year. I mean, Breslow's from Connecticut. He, you know, he spent a lot of time in Boston. I, I don't know that he necessarily wants to go somewhere else. I think he'd like to get it done here. Uh, but, you know, the track record for GMs since Theo left, it's been about three and a half years. You get three and a half years here, and something happens. So the clock is ticking. We'll, we'll see where that goes with Breslow. Pete, who do you think the best manager this team has ever had and the best general manager this team has ever had? Well, the best manager, it's – it's clearly Terry. It's, I don't see how it can't be. I mean, he, you know, the things that he did, the way he handled that team, I, I don't see how you could say it's anybody other than Francona. Um, and in terms of general manager, I mean, I guess you have to say Theo because he broke the curse um, and, and he, you know, he, he made some incredibly smart decisions with, with you know, with help from people, certainly. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's hard. You know, the, the Red Sox had some terrific years you know, before they broke the curse, 
But the fact that it went, they went so long without winning, I don't see how you couldn't say oh, it's Francona and Epstein. I mean, those guys are the guys. I think they'll both end up in the Hall of Fame, um, and and that, and you know, in the end, that'll speak for itself. I mean, to me, they're no question about it. Hall of Famers, both guys. I, I don't see how you, you couldn't put them in Cooperstown. Does Dan Duquette get enough credit for that 4 team? No, he doesn't. Um, and, and I'm sure that bothers him, but. He, you know, he did make, you know, he was responsible for Pedro. He was responsible for a number of those guys. Um, but I think it also had kind of run its course with him when he left. I, you know, I think that that was part of it, too. Yeah, that was you, a weird time. Let me ask you about Alex Cora. Um, will this be his last year in uniform as a field manager? Is he destined to be a general manager, a front office type with some other team or this team? Well, I think it's his last year as the field manager of the Red Sox, one way one way or another. I think like a lot of managers, they saw what Craig Council got from the Cubs, $8 million a year. I think they're all saying, how come I'm, you know, I want a World <laughs> Series. I'm not getting that much money. Um, so I, I think for a lot of managers, they're, they're interested in becoming free agents and seeing where it goes because they're asking, they ask a lot of the manager now. You have to incorporate this game plan that's done by other people, you know, the analytics people. The coaching staff used to be five guys, and three of them are guys who are your buddies that you used to play with. The coaching staff now is like 12 or 13 guys, and you have to you know, manage that as well. You have this entire – you know, the Red Sox travel with like 50 people, like with all of the different people that are around. The manager has to make all of that work. It, it, it's a big job, and, and you, know, you have to represent the team to the media twice a day. You have to do all of these other different events. You have to show up at all of these things. So I think – Cora wants to find out, you know, how much is he worth to do this? And whether that's with the Red Sox or the, you know, whoever it may be, I think he's going to find out after the season's over. I don't know how much longer he wants to manage. He's, he's got sons who are getting to the point where they're old enough to play Little League. I think he wants to be around for that. Um, he doesn't want to be one of those guys who, you know, doesn't see his kids grow up, ends up getting divorced, you know, has a, a, a bad – life off the field like so many of these managers have um maybe he's got three or four years left as a manager and then he goes back to espn or he, he goes to the front office or he does something else i don't know but I, I don't think he wants to be a guy who's wakes up one day and he's he's 60 years old and he's been doing this for 20 years and you know he never sees his kids i don't i don't you know i know for a fact he doesn't want to be that guy do you think he if he was if he was handed some quality players some uh, some free agents wanted to come here. Let's say it was like it was 10 years ago. That might change his frame of mind. I mean, maybe. I, I think philosophy does have something to do with it. If you consider, you know, when he was hired, he was hired by Dave Dombrowski, who was hell-bent on putting together a championship team. Well, guess what? Dave put together a championship team. Now it's different. But at the same time, Cora has a lot of um, loyalty to the Red Sox because they hired him back after he was suspended and they very easily could have said, we can't bring him back. Yeah. You know, what, what he did was wrong. We, you know, we can't be associated with that, but they did, they bought him back and he's loyal to that. But how long does that last? Does that last for 10 years? I don't know. I, it's lasted for three. I don't know that it's going to go beyond that. Look, I know primarily you're a baseball guy and have been for a long time inside and out. I'm not going to ask you about what you think about the future of this game is. I really, the Fenway Sports Group has answered that question as far as I'm concerned, because they obviously have turned their attention to other things. But that's a business decision. It's, it's not anything other than that. But I want about what about some of these? Other, I was going to really dying to ask you about Caitlin Clark, and I just don't want to get into that, you know, jump away from baseball. But tell me a little bit what, what's going through your mind here. Well, I, I watched that entire game beginning to end, and uh, I covered the UConn basketball team for a while before I got into baseball, and it was kind of when Gino Auriemma was putting together that program and all of the success they had. I, I read somewhere that the, the Iowa-LSU game had higher ratings than any baseball game last year, all but one or two NFL games, any NBA game. Like, it was the most watched sports event in the country, I think, for the over the course of a year. Unbelievable. Yeah, and it was a fantastic game. I mean, how, how, I, mean I, don't, doesn't, I don't care who's playing. That was a fantastic game to watch. 
and and so was the UConn game, frankly, with you know yes. the kid Paige Beckers. I mean, that was a really good game too. They, UConn played seven people and they won. They went to the final four. Um, I mean, the thing that is amazing to me about Caitlin Clark, as somebody who's covered a decent amount of basketball in his time, she shoots thirty-five foot shots like it's nothing. Like he's she's playing to get a thirty-five foot shot. <laughs> comes exactly. up looking to shoot like a thirty-five. It's amazing. Like that's what that's what's amazing to me is the confidence that she shoots those shots. It, it's a, it's like nothing. You're right. It's just uh, I can tell you it was almost watching that game was almost a visceral uh, waiting for it. I, I can just tell you this. I, everybody's got their own reason. Lynchy watched it, or why you watched it, or why I watched it. I'm driving up from Hilton Head. And I'm looking at the clock, and I know the game's on ESPN. And I just got to figure a place to stay. I, seriously, this watching that game, it determined what I was going to do. I had to find a place to stay so I could get in front of a television to watch that game. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why was that? It was just, I, it was amazing. You know, I just had never felt that way about anything. Yeah. The other thing I find incredible about about her is what did she end up with? It was like 35 points, I think, right, or something like 41. that. Well, yeah, and it was an unselfish forty-one. Like she shares the ball. It's not yeah. like she's just jacking up shots. Like she had a bunch of assists, and she looks for her teammates. And and you know she she I don't know. It's a it's a it's hard to imagine somebody who scores that many points is an unselfish player. But she's an unselfish player. Yeah, she is. She uh, if you add up uh, all her assists on top of her, let's just say that they were just two pointers. So she had 15 assists. That's another 30 points. That's 71 yeah. points she was responsible for. And some yeah. of those assists were, you know, probably on on three point shots as well. Yeah. But, you know, she she looks to help the team first. Is there someone breaking to the basket? Is there someone going back door? Bang! The pass is there. She's not like everyone's comparing her to Maravich, who I loved as a kid growing up. But Maravich, yeah. you know, he just was looking for his shot. He wasn't looking for the you know to pass to anybody else. Well, she threw a baseball pass to the uh, their their power forward. And the kid caught it, and she, she it was a beautiful pass. It was like a 55-foot pass. Hit the kid in stride for a layup. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I don't care what level of basketball you're talking about. That's a hell of a pass. I mean, it's you know, a three-point shot. Every, the three-point shot, everybody thinks the three-point shot has ruined the NBA, but it's made the the women's game it is. Well, I know. Her, her curling off a screen at 35 feet and, and putting up a jump shot is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And you came and this one, she did it nine right? times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's fun to watch. I mean, I'm I'm look I'm looking forward to you know seeing what happens over the weekend. Yeah, Friday night. I've already cleared the schedule. Not, See, not there you go. This is absolutely that's it's not so must, must see TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah no doubt about it. Absolutely. All right, I got to do this commercial. Yeah. We got a big question coming up for you too. Mike's got to <laughs> answer the question, but campers. It's time to be thinking about a new RV. Our friends at Cold Springs RV are ready for you. So you got to see the latest in travel trailers, fifth wheelers, motorhomes, push ups, or that's pop ups. Push ups, you stay away from the pop ups you go to, and more. They have the best selection and even an indoor heated showroom for the pop ups. So visit Cold Springs RV in Ware, New Hampshire, which is just west of Goffstown and north of Drake. Uh, where in New Hampshire, or check out them online, of course, at coldspringsrv.com. And the question that Lynchy has is what we post to everyone that we are honored to have on. And Pete Abraham is our honored guest today. Mike? All right, Pete. We all know that John Madden had a Madden cruiser because he didn't like to fly. So Cold Springs RV is in the process of building a Lobby slash Lynchy cruiser. Now, since we don't pay our guests, when they finally build, when they finally build this, don't pay the hosts. <laughs> Lobby Lynchy Cruiser. We're going to let you have it for a week, drive cross country, and we'll fly you back from the West Coast. But you must take one person riding shotgun with you, somebody you want to have a conversation with in a Cold Springs RV all the way across the country to uh, to what East Coast to the West Coast. It can be living can be deceased can be past can be present somebody you covered somebody you was always interested to do who would be riding shotgun with pete abraham oh that's an easy one it would be the great peter gammons really uh, wow. I don't about it. um when i was a kid i grew up in new bedford and we got the local paper and we got the globe and every day i would read the globe after wrestling it away from my father so i could read the globe sports section 
And when we went to Fenway Park, I didn't want to be Freddie Lynn or Dwight Evans. I wanted to be Peter Gammons. And I used to ask my dad, where does Peter Gammons sit? He said, he sits up there. And the first time I sat up there when I when I was starting to cover Major League Baseball, that was my dream. And and I would I would spend as much as time as I could with Peter and ask him about, you know, covering baseball and, and the things he did and the players he saw. Every time I see him in spring training, I'm sure I'm annoying because I ask him a lot of questions. I forget my job that day and I ask him questions. Uh, he's always so gracious. He's always been so nice uh, since I got to the Globe. And I, I, I mean, I, this is going to sound corny, but I think about him almost every day and like trying to live up to the legacy of what he did at the Globe because he, he I mean, he's the greatest baseball writer that there ever was. And I, to me, like, you know, re, re, covering the Red Sox for the Globe and following in his footsteps, you know, feels like what it must be to have played for the Celtics, you know, after Larry Bird. I mean, like that's how it, that's how important Peter is to me. And I would get, yeah, I would get an RV with him to go across the street or to California, whatever you guys want. I would, I would love to spend any time I could with Peter. What a great answer! That's a, it is a great answer, and uh, um, you may not get many questions in by the time you hit the Mississippi River. You know, that's people, okay. I don't, I don't mind just to hear him talk about the guys he covered and the, and the stories he could tell and uh, the way baseball was covered back then. It, it's so much different than it is now. The, you know, the access that those guys had uh, the stories about the globe and everything. I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. And he, um, you know, it's funny. I, you know, you've heard that expression, you know, you don't want to meet your heroes cause you don't know what they're going to be like. <laughs> the first time I met Peter, I was kind of nervous. Cause I was like, what if Peter Gammons isn't a nice guy? I'm going to be crushed. And he couldn't have been any nicer. He just literally could not have been any nicer. And he's been nice the entire time. And uh, it's, you know, every time I'm around him, I'm, I, I feel like that little kid going to Fenway Park asking my dad where he sits. Wow. Remember his notes calling when that came out? He needed like three timeouts to, to read the thing on a Sunday. You know, there was in New Bedford, we had a kid who was getting scouted when I was a senior in high school. And I, we, there was no email. I wrote an actual letter to Peter and saying, hey, you might be interested in knowing this kid's being scouted. He goes to New Bedford High, and, you know, he, he's done this and that. And two weeks later, a line popped up in his Sunday column. And really? Mentioning, and, man, I tell you what, I, I couldn't – it was, like, the happiest thing that had happened. <laughs> like, I was so excited. I cut that out, and I put it in my room. Like, oh, it was so – it was so exciting. That's and so cool. I, I was – yeah, it was – that guy – Reading him when I was a kid. I mean, that's why I'm doing this is because I wanted to be that guy. That's just such a great story, Pete. That in itself is it's just great to hear. Yeah. You- I wrote for my hometown paper in New Bedford, covered, you know, the high school stuff. And that was fun. I thought this would be great. I love, you know, I could do this the rest of my life. And, you know, one thing led to another and, and, I, and I got to the Globe. So I'm super, super fortunate. And you're sitting in a chair that, that your hero sat in for so many years. Well, thank God the Red Sox got new chairs in the press box because the old ones were, were terrible. But no, I mean, I'm at least I'm sitting in the same space, which is more than enough for me. Yeah, That's Peter. Uh, one, one great thing about Peter is that he uh, he's he's been always been so kind to every young person breaking in the business. Yep. And he he knows that person might be a little intimidated walking up to him, and Pete has a has a way of making you feel at ease. Yeah, he sure does. And I, I've seen it so many times with other people and uh, he'll, you know, on, on Twitter, he'll, you know, he'll, one of us will write something and he'll, he'll, he'll say something nice about your story. And he, yeah, he's very, you know, uh, for a lot of people in our business, he's, he's been a very influential figure. Well, we started with Larry Lacino and Larry Lacino pretty as much, pretty much brought us together today. Uh, but I have, uh, I'm glad you're here because we can, your Caitlin Clark stuff is fabulous. What about the dynasty? Have you are you have you watched it? Are you sick of it? Do you have a comments about it? Uh, well, I I told my when I got hired by the Globe, I said I'll do anything you want me to do, but please don't send me to cover the Patriots because my family has had Patriots season tickets since the '60s. Like we are died in the wool, love the Patriots. I've been to road games. I have a John Hanna jersey. I act like a complete jackass when I go to games, and I, I cannot be trusted to cover the Patriots. And they only sent me once, and I managed not to make a fool of myself, and I was very happy about that. And I, I said, please don't ever send me again. So I have watched the Dynasty. Um, I'm a little annoyed by it because it makes Belichick out to be like this. Somehow the, 
they won despite this terrible guy who was the coach, which is certainly not true. And it comes off like a like a commercial to elect Bob Kraft to the Hall of Fame, which is fine. He probably should be in the Hall of Fame, but like I, I just thought it was way too negative about Belichick. I thought there was a lot of stuff that didn't necessarily need to be kind of relitigated. I was just more interested in, you know, the players talking about the good times. I didn't really need to hear the whole Aaron Hernandez thing again and some of the other stuff that, you know, the flake gate and all of that business. But I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I couldn't be more in the bag for the Patriots. So I'm not the guy to ask, but um, I, th- I mean, I thought it was interesting to hear the, the behind the scenes stuff and the players talking and some of the, audio clips that they had that you'd never seen before. Uh, but I, I thought it wasn't, I thought it wasn't fair to, to Belichick at all. Do you think if, if, if the intent was to uh, elevate uh, Robert's uh, ascension into uh, the pro football hall of fame, do you think it backfired on them? If that was the intent? I mean, uh, you know, the, the football hall of fame is interesting because it, it's literally like that smoke filled room, right? You don't know how anybody voted. You don't know, kind of the process behind it. You just know that they come out of the room and they say, okay, these guys are in the Hall of Fame. So I don't know. I, I don't know how those guys will view that. Maybe they'll view it negatively that he's kind of campaigning for it. I don't know. Um, it's, it's you know, the baseball writers get a hard time on our Hall of Fame votes, but at least we we publish who voted, how we voted, who got how many votes. And football, you really don't know what the process is. It feels like in football they make you wait for a certain amount of time until they let you in. So I don't know what's going to happen with Kraft. I mean, I to me, you should. How can he not be in the Hall of Fame? It doesn't make any sense. But I wonder if. I, yeah, it's a good question, Mike. I don't know whether this will help him or hurt him. I don't know. And speaking of the Hall of Fame, the obvious question is: How can Bill Parcells be in the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, and not the one oh, in yeah. Foxborough? That, yeah, <laughs> I mean, team Hall of Fames can be very petty. I think for a lot in a lot of cases, and that certainly seems to be ridiculously petty. I mean. As a Patriots fan, I mean, I mean, yes, everything changed with Brady and Bill, no question about it. But things started to change because of Parcells. I mean, that's, you know, Parcells really kind of dragged them into competitiveness after they hadn't been for a long time. So true. And then Kraft didn't hire Parcells. It was Orthwine that hired Parcells. Right. And right. Just, and he fought with Kraft, right? The whole buying the groceries. It was, Kraft, right? it was great. It was kind of the interesting part of the dynasty, too. But uh, yeah. When Parcells, Parcells speaks, you really have to listen. You know, it's funny. When we go to Jupiter, Florida for spring training, uh, the Cardinals play there and the Marlins play there. Parcells is there quite a bit. He lives in that area, and he goes to a lot of the spring training games. He's a big baseball fan. And, uh, you know, every once in a while you see him, you know, sitting there watching the games. He really likes it. Pete, this is my last question. Promise. My last question. <laughs> the teams and the, the sports in Boston – Baseball used to be absolutely unquestionably number one, and everything else would follow. The Patriots used to be last. And the Celtics, Bruins, Bruins are a, a fan base unto themselves. And the Celtics, well, you know, it kind of rises and falls with the tide. But the Red Sox always were, always were there. It seems that it's just turned around. The Patriots are the ones that are there, perhaps because of the popularity of the NFL perhaps because of the gambling, who knows. And the Red Sox are on the other end of that spectrum. Will they ever come, will baseball and the Red Sox ever come back to that number one position? I don't, I don't think that's going to happen anywhere, to be honest. I mean, I don't, you know, we can, we can follow how our stories are read on the Globe website, like right down to the minute, who's reading what. And we could, anything we publish about the Patriots immediately becomes the most read thing on the website. And... <laughs> That's not always the case with the Red Sox stuff. It is pretty often, but not always. And we could we could run the most, you know, Patriots put so and so on the injured list, or Patriots, you know, whatever it is, not really big news. And then right away, everybody reads it. And I mean, I, the television ratings are what they are. And and yeah, the NFL runs the world. I mean, I, I don't see that ever changing. And I think what you mentioned about the gambling is is part of it. Everybody. Everybody plays fantasy football. It seems like everybody has an account to gamble on football. And, uh, yeah, the NFL is a behemoth unto itself, and I, I don't see how that's ever going to change. Remember all the signs that used to be in Major League, every Major League sport, but especially in baseball, uh, when you walk into the locker room, condemning gambling, if you even whisper the word, you might lose your press credential. Now it's, it's on every scoreboard uh, in every ballpark across the country. 
there's some something bad's going to happen in baseball. I mean, I think they dodged the bullet with Otani if if, the, if actually nothing happened. But it's it's happened in football. They've suspended a bunch of players. They, they're investigating some NBA players now. I don't know how you could be a baseball player and see the 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 the, the gambling logos on the wall of the stadium, on the Green Monster at Fenway Park, and and know that people are in the stands gambling. The Cubs have a sports book connected to Wrigley Field. The Nationals have a sports book connected to their park. If Mass the second Massachusetts allows it, you know the Red Sox will have one connected to Fenway. So you could have people sitting next to the on deck circle putting money on the game, and you're going to tell the players whatever you do, you, you can't have anything to do with gambling. That's that's. I don't think that's realistic. I think there's going to be some kind of terrible scandal in baseball, whether it's players or the coaches or you know in, in, inside information being handed out. Some, there's going to be something bad that's going to happen with this. And if you're a fan of a certain team, you just got to pray it's not going to be your team. So keep, uh, bearing that in mind, should Pete Rose be hopeful that he might someday be in the Hall of Fame? No, I don't. Th I think what Rose did in gambling on his own team as the manager of the team, he really corrupted the whole system because – what, like let's say he had lost three days in a row. How much did he change how he handled the pitching staff on the fourth day to make sure he won? I think that like, you know having the manager betting with a bookie. I mean that how dangerous was that? I mean I, I just I don't see he's on the suspended list. He's applied to come off. He's never been allowed to come off. He's gone from saying I never bet on baseball to I did bet on baseball. Now I'm going to write a book about it to try to make money. He shows up at Cooperstown for the induction weekend, and he'll sign. He'll literally sign, I'm sorry I bet on baseball on a baseball if you pay him enough money to do it. Or he'll sign, I did bet on baseball on a baseball. If you, He'll sign whatever you want. He just wants to make money. I think he's handled it so crassly that he's never going to – they're never going to clear the way to put him in the Hall of Fame. I, never, I can't imagine that happening. And just because betting is, is legal now – um, what you know, Rose, like as you said, there was always these signs on the clubhouse wall. You can't bet on baseball. He knew what he was doing was wrong, and he did it. I think now you could almost say players don't get it because it's so pervasive in society. I mean, he bet through a bookie. It wasn't like he went to the sports book. I mean, I, I don't ever see the Hall of Fame saying, "Yeah, we're going to let him in." I, don't, I can't imagine that happens. All right, I got uh, one more piece of business right here. And this is never a gamble when you go over to George Grace, Lexus, and Toyota, because if you're thinking about a new vehicle, go where Loby and Lynchy go. Go see our good friend George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota. We've been customers for years because we know that George Gray will treat you right. They're a family owned and operated dealership that we trust and you can trust as well. Go see the big wheel, we call him. The big wheel is George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota, 409 Mass Ave. In Lexington, head on over there. George will uh, take care of you. His staff will take care of you. Uh, and you'll be friends for life with George and with all the members of George Gray's Lexington Toyota. Well, we can't promise you we're going to get together and watch the Red Sox next outing, but we can promise you we'll be together for Caitlin Clark on Friday night. <laughs> That's right. We'll be watching that game for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Pete, you were great today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's uh, a real pleasure. Pete, well, Pete, Pete Abraham of the Boston Globe, the pride of New Bedford. That's right. The Willers. The Willers. All right. And we'll see you next time. And make sure you follow us on unanchoredboston.com.